Thanks so much for the warm welcome I've received in my uh, t time here in Narrabri. You know, they say, join the army, see the world. Uh, they never never mention Narrabri when they say that. Uh, it's, it's been great to be here and uh, especially to enjoy uh, meals together, to have conversation over food and uh, get to know some of you just a little bit. Um, I won't even remember the names from yesterday of the people that I met, but it's been really great to be here. Uh, in some ways, that's in contrast with another experience I had a little while back. My family was invited uh, to attend a particular event, so my wife and at that time my young children came along to meet with a group of men who were basically homeless uh, people who had mental health issues. And it was an evening meal where we sat with these men and engaged in conversation. And the man nearest to me, and I remember this quite vividly, had very large hands. And he spent the entire meal with his finger up his nose. Uh, he was reaching places that you wouldn't have thought possible. <laughs> and the things that he said were even more disturbing. I, I think we were eating chicken. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Um, the first thing that I want to observe is that in keeping with the Old Testament, the remnant is bigger than you think. So my argument from chapter 9 was that Israel is less than you think. And Paul makes that very clear that we, we need to deal with the, the narrowing lines that go along because Abraham had seven sons who are not children of promise, but there's one who is, namely Isaac. So he kept whittling things down. But in this uh, chapter, Paul, having explained why it's a smaller group than you think in chapter 10, argues that it's actually bigger than you think. And that's what we'll look at today. And that's what he uh, argues in the first uh, section verses 1 to 6. Somebody might say, has God rejected his people? And so there's a little bit of a dialogue going on. I think here Paul says, well, that's a dumb question. Of course he didn't. I'm exhibit A. I'm a Jew. To which they answer, okay, so Paul, there's one. That's not a very strong argument. And Paul replies, well, there's James. And they say, no, Herod killed James. And Paul says, no, I meant the other James. And they say, well, he's dead too. It's not easy to make the argument, but Paul says God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? And this was read so well for us earlier. They've killed everybody. I'm the only one left. This is from 1 Kings chapter 19. In the scriptures record that the Lord says, no, you're wrong. I have left 7,000 for myself. There are, you're not the only one, Elijah. There are 7,000. There are far more than you know. And the number 7,000, well, 1,000 is basically the biggest number in their counting system. And of course, seven in the Bible is a special number. So God is saying, take the biggest number that you can imagine, and even that's not big enough. Multiply that by seven to get a sense of the size of my people. You are not the only one. And the same situation appears again in Paul's day. In the same way, verse 5, then there is also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. There are more than you think. The same situation appears, and in some measure Paul, as special apostle to the Gentiles, takes on the Elijah role. Things might look small, but there are more than you can count. In chapter 9, Paul argued that there's less than you think. Now he argues that believing Israel is more than you think. Verse 6, Paul, as, he's, uh, as he tends to do, brings in the gospel. Now, if by grace, then it's not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. So again, he reminds us that this is about faith, God's grace, God's kindness, God's well, his undeserved favor that he pours out upon his people. And so the gospel comes in. The remnant is chosen by grace, by what God does. And if it's by grace, well, then it can't be based on what we do. We can't earn salvation by our religious life or through social justice, for that matter, or anything else, as good as those things might be. According to the Bible, it's something given by God to those who believe, to those who identify with Jesus by faith and find salvation and ultimately resurrection life in the Lord Jesus. So verses 1 to 6. Verses 7 to 10. In keeping with the Old Testament again, God is behind the blindness. The end of chapter 10 quoted Moses and Isaiah. Now Paul quotes Moses 
Isaiah and David. The breadth of the Old Testament, the whole of the Old Testament, you might say, teaches that God will harden the others. Paul begins with a, let's call it a Moses-Isaiah mashup, and then he quotes David in Psalm 69, and he refers to eyes that cannot see, ears that could not hear, eyes again that are darkened so that they cannot see, and a back that is bent forever. Uh, Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent continually. So it's God's doing, and it brings a darkness, and it's continual. It's God's doing. It's predicted in the Old Testament. And so you may be wondering, well, why does God treat his special people this way? That's chapter 10. Maybe you're saying, hey, that's not fair. Well, that's chapter 9. So Paul has dealt with all the objections. And no doubt during his ministry, his wide-ranging ministry, he's heard all the objections and he addresses them in this argument as it unfolds. God says, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent continually, be bent forever. So the third thing for us to observe in verses 11 to 16, in keeping with the Old Testament, once again, Gentile salvation leads to Israel's salvation. The last word of verse 10 in the NIV is forever. In our translations, it's continually. And so Paul says, is it really forever? The Greek words in Paul's quotation of Psalm 69 move close enough to meaning forever that at least we have to raise the question. But I think continually is a better rendering. Continually means that it has a long duration, but isn't necessarily permanent. So it makes sense to ask this question, will it be forever? Not because the phrase means permanently, but because at least, well, it raises various possibilities. And Paul's answer then is, verse 11, absolutely not. No. First, Verses 11 to 12 speak of God's plan, which includes saving the Gentiles to make Israel envious with a view to the salvation of the Jews. On the contrary, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. So God's purposes are at work, and jealousy is becoming a motivation within God's plan. Then verses 14 to 15 repeats the pattern. Paul's Gentile ministry, he says, if I might somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them, for if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So he repeats this pattern. Paul's Gentile ministry has the effect of provoking Israel's envy with a view to saving Israel. I'm tempted to take a step back and go off script and say, why do we care about Israel? What's this got to do with us? And so I'm reminded that the the reason Paul has to enter into the discussion is because the Old Testament is full of incredible promises to Israel. And the New Testament is full of incredible promises to us as believers in the Lord Jesus. If God isn't faithful to those promises, what right do we have to expect him to be faithful to the promises to us? So Paul has to address this issue. Has God rejected his people, those who received his promises? Is God a promise-keeping God, or is he not? Well, if you ask, has he rejected his people, his answer is right there, absolutely not. So what's that look like in the outworking of it, in the unfolding of this? And Paul is arguing that if something so tragic leads to a good outcome, how much, well, how much better will it be when the Jews do turn to Christ, when they do discover their Messiah, and they are brought in, it's almost as though he's saying where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Verses 13 to 16 then repeat much of 11 to 13, but some elements are now brought into sharper focus. In the end, in these verses, Paul speaks three times of jealousy or envy. Already in chapter 10, verse 19, he'd introduced the topic because it was there in the scriptures that he was quoting. I will make you angry by a nation that lacks... Sorry, I'll go back a bit further in that verse. Um, Verse 19, first Moses said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. What do you mean jealous? What's the effect of their jealousy? That's what Paul is explaining in chapter 11. The jealousy that Paul depends on to bring them to the acceptance of their Messiah. So chapter 10, verse 19, quoting scripture, introduces this notion of jealousy. Jealousy. 
And then it's there again in chapter 11, verse 11 and 11, 14. And now he's exploring how that happens. The how includes his ministry among the Gentiles. I want Israel to be saved, so I'm going to go to the Gentiles. That's a bit different from my ministry logic. If I want people in Newtown to be saved, where am I going to go? I'm going to Newtown. But that's what Paul is saying, because he believes his ministry of drawing Gentiles to the Messiah, this impossibility, will provoke the Jewish people to jealousy, and they will respond to the Messiah. And we see this pattern repeated throughout the scriptures of Paul's ministry. We turn to the book of Acts, and Paul would preach to the Jews, and they would t- turn him away. What did he do? He would go to the Gentiles, and some would turn to the God of Israel. And then the Jews come back into the story, and they express their jealousy, and sometimes they treat Paul really badly. And people along the way are saved. It's throughout the book of Acts. Um, In order to make these things clear, Paul explicitly mentions that he's now talking to the Gentiles. Verse 13, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Insofar as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, what do I do? I magnify my ministry. The main addition to what he said in the lead up to these verses relates to his own ministry. So we're now getting a direct window into a conversation that Paul is having with the Gentiles in Rome. And I think it's pretty easy to imagine the Gentile Christians in Rome saying, well, you know, God clearly favors us over the Jews. Um, Even Paul himself turns to bring the message of salvation to us rather than to the Jews. He's the apostle to the Gentiles because we're where the action is. So Paul answers them, look, I do not downplay my ministry to the Gentiles. I take pride in it. I lift it up. Did you ever notice how in the book of Acts, Paul always starts in the synagogues in places of Jewish gathering, and then if things head south, that's when he turns to the Gentiles? And a quick scan of the book of Acts reveals a number of situations where this happens. Um, And Paul doesn't go quietly. He announces that he's going to the Gentiles. This comes to a head in Acts 26. Paul is on trial. He's making his defense before Agrippa. And Paul says that, he preaches, and this is a quotation, what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. And precisely at this point, Festus reacts, shouting in a loud voice, you're out of your mind, Paul. You're insane. Going to the Gentiles is going too far. Apparently, the thought that the Messiah would suffer and die and be raised from the dead, well, Okay, we'll listen to that. But going to the Gentiles, that's when you go too far. And it's exactly at this point in his speech that Paul is cut off and, well, often abused in his ministry. And at the very end of the book of Acts, we hear Paul say, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. That's magnifying his ministry. It's the reason why he's so often arrested, why he's persecuted right up to death's door. So why does he keep it up? And that's what he's telling us. So that somehow, verse 14 of chapter 11, I may make my own people jealous and save some of them. This is his strategy for Jewish salvation. Envy, jealousy, and maybe you're thinking, you know, nobody would ever be jealous of me. Nobody would ever be envious of me. And I've heard Jewish scholars scoff and say, you must be joking. Why would we ever be envious of Christians? But the envy that Paul is talking about from his quotation back in chapter 10 and what he's talking about now is directed not toward me, but toward God. They will recognize that God is present, that God is in our midst, that God has sent his Messiah and poured out his spirit, and they'll want that. And in wanting these things, some of them will turn to Jesus. You know, way back in chapter 2 of Romans, Paul warned against Jewish arrogance. And here now, he warns against Gentile arrogance. That's where he goes in the um, the next section of his chapter. Now, I want to um, move quickly over the material that runs from verses 17 to 24 because it's about farming imagery. And I would not be so bold as to come to Nerebrai and say much of anything about farming. 
Paul talks about an olive tree, and I don't know anything about olive trees. Um, one thing I do know is that when Paul talks about an olive tree, he only talks about one tree, but lots of branches. And sometimes people treat this as though there are actually two trees, maybe let's say the Jewish tree and the Gentile tree. No, there's only one tree with lots of branches. And um, the, the key idea through this section is, well, in verse 18, it says, do not brag. But if you do brag, know this. In verse 20, it says, do not be arrogant, but be afraid. In verse 25, it says, so that you will not be conceited, brothers. I do not want you to be unaware of this ministry. So multiple times in the section, Paul is concerned with arrogance and boasting of bragging. It's as though these people assume, yeah, we're the people of God now, and they're out, and, well, we're all that. And again, I wonder, what does this have to do with us? What is this really trying to teach us? And maybe this will work, maybe it won't. Um, I was at a Presbyterian church that was comprised mainly of Scottish people. And then after a little while, it wasn't anymore comprised mainly of Scottish people. It was comprised of a lot of Koreans, especially, because the Presbyterian church was really thriving in various places in, uh, in Asian countries. And so how do those Scottish people view this new group that's moved in? And in the end... They wouldn't use this language, I don't think, but they've kind of taken over. How does that first group, where they say, this is our church, view the newcomer? And now the question is, how does the newcomer view those people who are now the tired old people who don't seem to have anything to contribute, where we've got youth and energy and vigor on our side? Well, maybe there's something in that uh, when Paul talks about Israel and the Gentiles. The people of God, how do they relate to Israel? How do the Christian Gentiles in Rome relate to these Old Testament truths, we might say, and the Old Testament people of God? Well, arrogance is always a danger. It always has a way of creeping into our hearts. And Paul is saying, don't boast, don't be arrogant. There's a danger here. And he says, be afraid. And again, I wonder, how often do people stand in this pulpit and say, be afraid? The gospel drives out fear, doesn't it? So why would Paul say, don't be arrogant, but be afraid? For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Well, that's scary. That's frightening. You mean I can be excluded from God's people? We had a question yesterday about assurance. And we need to set that alongside what Paul is saying here. Therefore, I'm at verse 22, consider God's kindness and severity, severity toward those who have fallen out, uh, sorry, who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you, if you remain in his kindness. Oh, you mean I have to persevere? The parable of the seller comes to mind, doesn't it? And again, I don't want to talk too much about farming in this context. But Jesus has very direct and clear things to say about the seed that lands on different types of soil and the plant that grows up. And the, the one that is, is held up is the one that, well, bears fruit, that produces fruit, that does something useful long term. If you remain in his kindness, and he's not done yet scaring me because he goes on to say, otherwise you too will be cut off. Those branches were cut off. Guess what? You can be cut off too. Unless what? Unless you remain in his kindness. And he's defined his kindness as that message of faith and grace. God is at work choosing his people, bringing them to salvation, um, showing them his kindness. And what does he call for us? Well, the response of faith. That's what chapter 10 was about, the response of faith. Do we remain in his kindness? But if it's all about faith, verse 23, then even they, if they don't remain in unbelief, well, they can be joined back in. That's a pretty compelling promise, isn't it? That those who have been, in a sense, separated from the tree, which I believe is the promises to Abraham and especially those which find their focus in the Messiah and therefore the person of the Messiah, those who have been grafted into the Messiah, well, that's us, can rejoice in life, and those who have been cut off can be grafted back in to their Messiah and our Messiah. Verse 24, for if they were cut off from your 
native wild olive and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So again, Paul is elevating uh, the, the, uh, the Jew in this story. Verse 25, so that you will not be conceited, brothers, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Why has all this happened? Why is it unfolding this way? A partial hardening has come to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. I'm going to pause right there. I do not want you to be unaware of the mystery. The plan of God is that Israel is hardened while the Gentiles come in. But it's a partial hardening. And Jews do get saved. We have Jewish students at college, not in huge numbers, but people who have come to Christ and are now Christians and some of them in Christian ministry. Um, it does happen. Again, not in huge numbers, but maybe more than we realize. And this hardening that has come to Israel will last until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. There were church leaders and thinkers in the past who actually said, don't engage in too much Jewish ministry because we don't want to bring about the end too soon. We want opportunity for us to share the gospel with Gentiles because they see this as something that brings about the end. It will come, the hardening will last until the full number of Gentiles has come in. I don't know what the full number of Gentiles is. How can I put a number on it? So get on with the business of bringing Gentiles to Christ. But Paul is saying that's how long the hardening will last. There will come a day when this hardening will come to an end and this way, all Israel will be saved. What do you mean all Israel will be saved? The liberator will come from Zion. He will turn away godlessness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Isaiah 59 looks ahead to a time when Israel will turn to their Messiah. Do you believe that? That's a hard one to swallow, I would say. But it's a biblical promise that a day is coming when Israel will one day respond to what we know as the gospel and the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. This day is still ahead. Regarding the gospel, they're enemies for your advantage. That is to say, we get the good things because of their lack of faith. But regarding election, they're still loved by God because of the patriarchs. Yesterday I was asked if God has a soft spot for Israel. And I said, yes, I believe he does. We have to define Israel to answer that question. But clearly God does love Israel because of the patriarchs, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. God calls effectively. And as you once disobeyed God, you Gentiles, but you've now received mercy through their disobedience, so they too now have disobeyed, resulting in mercy to you. So the Gentiles benefit in a huge way from Jewish rejection of their Messiah, but this will one day come to an end, so that they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned everybody, Jew and Gentile, in disobedience, so that he may have mercy on everybody, Jew and Gentile. And so God loves his people. God loves Jewish people. God loves Gentile people. And he's bringing people to salvation. So don't be arrogant. Later, Paul's going to discuss the strong and the weak. Those who hold one day to be more sacred than another, for example, or think there are things that you shouldn't eat for religious reasons. Chapter 14, verse 10 says, Why do you treat your brother or sister with contempt? It seems clear enough that the Gentiles look down on the Jewish relations as inferior. And there's an element of irony to all this. For a long time, the gospel had spread in a primarily Jewish environment, and they had debates about what Gentiles need to do to be acceptable. Was faith enough, or were there other conditions? Did they need to become Jews, or something like quasi-Jews, to be included in the people of God? After all, you know, these Gentiles are unclean. They are like the pigs that they eat. Their religious life is offensive. They engage in sexual perversity all the time. It's one of those things that defines them. We're not like that. We don't want to be around people like that. We don't even want our children to be around people like that. And now the tables are turned. The Gentiles are ascendant. God dwells among them by his Holy Spirit. It's the Jews who are the odd ones. They have their bizarre customs, their off-putting ways. Their food is different. And 
Like they even smell funny and they call us pigs. And Paul has knocked down the door to the Gentiles so that they can be accepted as part of the family of God. And now he's equally committed to seeing Jewish believers recognized as part of God's family. And you and I probably don't wrestle, at least in the same way, with Jew-Gentile issues. But do we erect barriers? Do we impose cultural requirements because they think we think they have some sort of spiritual significance? And our textbook answer to that, of course, is no, we wouldn't do that. But what's the reality? What's the reality? Do we sometimes uh, erect those sort of barriers? Do we have blind spots that need to be revealed to us? Do we prioritize maybe what's good for our own families over the gospel when we make our plans? Are we willing to go where God sends us with no expectation that we'll find people who talk and think and most importantly maybe eat like us? Are we willing to go along and eat with someone who keeps his pudgy finger in his nose throughout the entire meal? To be honest, I don't know if I could do that again. But it would be an odd sort of arrogance to think that I'm somehow closer to a holy God than to a person like that. Paul calls for lives without borders. What boundaries have you set around your own willingness to serve the God of all nations? Let me take a few minutes to um, wrap things up by talking about a a friend of mine. Um, His name was Bill, and he was one of the groomsmen at our wedding. Um, Bill was a a Jewish-Italian from the Bronx in New York. When Bill was young, his dad was killed in a shootout while robbing a bank. At 30 years old, Bill was a drug addict and involved with the New York mob, and he was a big, scary, ugly-looking dude. And at 32 years old, Bill was a first-year student at a Bible college in Chicago. He was in the same class as my wife. Uh, When he became a Christian, he entered a methadone program to treat his his addictions, but he was miraculously delivered. And one day he returned the bottles of methadone to the clinic. And um, the first time he ever shared his testimony was when they looked at him as though he was crazy, methadone having a very high street value in New York. So he had to explain why he was turning in five full bottles of this stuff. And the only answer he could come up with on on the spot was, Jesus set me free. Um, At Bible college, he was eager to study the scriptures and learn how he could serve the Lord. And whenever missionary speakers came to college and issued their call to go on the mission field, he would would be sort of agitated about that. And he understood why they were doing it, but he was desperate to get back to New York to tell people there about the Lord Jesus. And within three years of coming to Christ, he was leading teams to uh, the streets of New York to share Jesus. And when I think of uh, uh, Bill, I think of life from the dead. God's grace is extraordinary. God picked up what many of us would, I'm sure, identify as the hardest possible case and brought him to himself. If I were talking to people on the street and I saw Bill, I'd be looking for somebody else to talk to. But God saved him. Um, It's about four years since Bill died. He lived two lives. One that lasted far longer than he expected would. And the great truth is that because he is in Christ, this formerly angry, violent Jewish man, though he was dead, now he lives. And that proves very little about a final solution for Israel, final salvation for Israel. So why do I mention Bill? Because to me, he represents the impossible. Every salvation is a miracle. But I think of Bill as the impossible story. And when we consider Israel and the thought that they might turn to Jesus as their Savior and as their Messiah, that sounds impossible. And so I mentioned Bill to say, my God does the impossible. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would strip away from our hearts and eyes anything that keeps us from seeing you in your glory and in your saving grace. Please strip away from our hearts and minds anything that puts up barriers between us and those you've appointed to salvation. May we see your saving power 
as we declare Jesus among the nations. We pray it in his name. Amen. Uh, any quick questions for Philip? Uh, we'll go Chanel and then we'll go Roz, and I'll repeat the question so it's picked up on the live stream. Chanel. Um, I, this is, I guess, more to do with the shirt. I will say that first of all, but I don't know what I'm going to say. But you were saying here that Paul is warning um, against arrogance, saying God's kindness, but is it the assurance for the Christian not to knowing that God actually keeps us in him until that day? So the question is, isn't the assurance against that warning about falling away, isn't the assurance that God keeps us in his kindness? Yeah, that's a great question, and the answer to that is yes. It is God's grace that keeps us in his, uh, his kindness, and the fact that he's chosen us from before the foundations of the earth is something that fills us with um, so much assurance as a subjective reality and a security, did I say that right? Uh, assurance as a subjective reality, but also security as an objective truth about what God has done on our behalf. But the reality is that some people have assurance who shouldn't, and they need to be shaken up. And I'm going to say that the greatest tragedy in my work life is when people who have spent four years preparing for ministry have gone off and in some cases done something really stupid and destroyed their testimony and fallen out of the Christian life. So how do we hold those things together? One of the means by which God holds us close to himself the way he keeps us is by providing direct, truthful statements about perseverance and what that requires. So God does his part. Do we respond in faith and do we abide in faith? Ross. Uh, the question is, Philip said we need to clarify what we mean by Israel, and so Ros is asking him to do that now. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. That, that's sort of an ultimate question, isn't it? Um, so I'm not going to say we're talking about 1948 or a place on the map. We're talking about God's people, and in Paul's day they were scattered all over, and yet some lived in what we now call Palestine, although he would have never called it that. Um, so chapter 9 comes as close as we get to defining what Israel is. It's those who are descendants of Abraham through the promise and down to uh, Isaac and Jacob and so on. Uh, that's who Paul has in view. And what he's saying is, uh, not that Israel somehow gets bigger through, some people would say, Gentile inclusion. It actually gets smaller. Uh, so it's a reduced set of God's people. Uh, it's pretty hard for me to identify where we would find those people. I don't think we can do that. Paul doesn't know, so what does he do? Well, he travels the whole world to proclaim Christ. Um, so it's not an easily identifiable group, but it's those who are faithful to the Lord in Elijah's day, there were 7,000 who didn't bow down to the false Lord God. Baal means Lord. Um, it's those who acknowledge the true God. And in Paul's day, it's the same thing. Those who acknowledge the true God. 